did it again. I'm not talking about being late to class. The irony is this is Drummel 101. And because of her acting ability, she should be getting an A, but she's getting a C because she's late so often. I mean, you should see her at small group every Monday night. She puts on a smile, knows all the right answers, but at the end of it, they ask for prayer requests, and she says, yeah, I could use prayer for my grades. And everybody thinks she's doing great, but she's not. She keeps every Sunday going to church, and at the end of it, she'll text them. She'll say, hey, that was the last time, but every Wednesday night, she's right back here. I think in the Christian community, there's this idea that this story is an anomaly, but it's not. In this crowd of perfectly pure Christians who have it all together, they don't. 80% of unmarried Christians have had sex. 67% have been sexually active in the last year, while 76% believe sex outside of marriage is wrong. But let me throw one more statistic at you. 90% of the talks I heard growing up were all about my virginity and how important and sacred that is. I would watch as two pieces of paper got super glued together and then ripped and torn apart, leaving them tattered and torn. And then I would hear this talk about how premarital sex leaves you damaged. But the thing is, I don't need to be told that. I already know that in my heart. I already know that I'm damaged. Does the church need to tell me one more time that I'm damaged goods? I think so many Christians who have sex have this question, what do I do now? What do I do now? Does this talk really apply to me? I already messed up, I already screwed up. So does that just make me damaged goods? What do I do? Should I just give up on my purity? I mean, is that how Christ really views me as a screw up? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? The thought echoes in your head. I think, I think the walk of shame is just a crazy thing because the walk of shame is always done alone. We walk into church and we look around and we see all these people raising their hands. Boom, I surrender all. And they act like they have it all together and you feel like you're only alone. In small group, you go there every week and you look around and you're like, man, that person's an ulcer. That person's a stud. They're following the Bible completely. And as you wake up every morning and you walk to class, you wait for that text. You wait for that text from someone to say, man, I know who you are and what you've done. In John 8, uh, Jesus is there and there's a woman caught in adultery. Literally imagine this scene. She's in bed with a man who's not her husband. And people, all these religious people walk in and grab her by the wrist. They grab her by the wrist, pull her outside with just a bed sheet on and they throw her in the middle of the street. And as she's there, people start accusing her. They start yelling these things at her. Hey, you're a slut. Hey, you're a skank. Hey, you're a whore. You're kind of like a prostitute. You're an adulterer. Can you believe that? That's not her husband. And then they see Jesus and they pull him into the scene and they say, hey, Jesus, the law says to stone this woman. What should we do? And the crazy part is Jesus knows all these people's sins, yet he keeps silent. He knows, hey, I know you're junk. I know you screwed up as well. Stop acting like you're better than her. In Revelation 12.10, it says the devil is an accuser. You're never more like the devil than when you accuse and condemn someone else. And then Jesus says this statement, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. And you start to hear thud, thud, thud of stones dropping on the ground. People actually start to think about their own sin instead of their own self-righteousness. And as people think about the sin, their older ones leave first and then the younger ones and person after person leaves because they know they're not perfect. The Bible says no one is perfect, not one. The Bible, Bible also says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one's perfect, only Jesus is. And Jesus says this statement, where are your accusers? And she looks around and she doesn't see anyone. And then Jesus says something profound. He says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't come in the world to condemn the world. He didn't come in here to accuse you for your sin. He came to save you from it. He came to restore you. He came to bring healing and life. I think, I think the most powerful part of this story is that she's caught. She's caught in the act of adultery. I think with me growing up, I had this idea that I would wait six days, six months, six years to confess my sin, to tell people what I was really struggling with because I wanted to look like I had it together. I wanted to look like I could conquer my sin. I was strong enough. I could do this myself. If somebody's in a major car accident, they don't wait six weeks to see a doctor. They don't wait six months and they surely don't wait six years. They go and see him right away. I mean, can you think of this scene? Somebody walks into the doctor's office six weeks later and they go, hey, yeah, I was in a terrible car accident, but uh, I'm mostly over it. I mostly have recovered. I'm okay right now. 
and I'm mostly, but can you help me a little bit? Nobody does that, that's ludicrous, that's insanity, you'd never do that. I think in Christianity there's this idea that you have to be perfect. There's this ideal Christian, oh I'm perfect, I have it all together, I've done it. And Jesus never says this, Jesus never says, come to me all who are perfect and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come to me all who are weak and weary and I will give you rest. What would happen if Christians stopped acting like they had it all together? What would happen if Christians were actually open and honest? What would happen if people stopped walking in shame and started walking with Jesus? In this story in John 8, literally the next sentence that Jesus says is this. He says, I'm the light of the world. But what happened if Christians started walking in the light? Well, what happens if Christians actually confessed their sins? James 5.16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I think there's a lot of healing that could happen within the Christian community if we simply confessed our sins to, get to one another. If we actually prayed for one another so that we could be healed. Stop walking in sin and start walking in the light.